Hi, everybody, and welcome to Lunchtime Topics. I'm Kate Lance with the Creative Coast. If you haven't heard of the Creative Coast, we're a 501c3 nonprofit here in Savannah, Georgia, and we are funded by the City of Savannah and the Savannah Economic Development Authority to catalyze the innovation economy on the coast of Georgia. And what does that mean? We, we achieve this catalyzation through our educational and social programming. So um, educational programs are like lunchtime topics where we bring in this business expert like Tyler, who's our guest today, to share their wisdom with the startup and innovation community and help somebody start their own business or um, level up their business, improve their business. Um, we also have other programs like our um, Idea Accelerator Boot Camp, which is coming up in February, where that we take you through a 12-week um, boot camp series of starting a business and um, from everything from like um, defining your why to um, getting legal advice to um, figuring out your brand all the way to pitching refining your pitch and pitching in a pitch contest at the end of that. Um, another program we have that's coming up is our grit conference. It's the end of the month. I would be remiss if I did not mention it because we are doing, we're planning all things grit right now. It is our um, a two day conference that celebrates business tech and the arts and how all of that combines, combines together. So we're bringing in the hidden gems of Savannah, the innovators that live right here in Savannah, Georgia, that are doing these incredible things in their industry. And we're going to have panel discussions. We've got 12 lined up right now. We're going to have five keynotes speak. Um, and we are going to have a startup stage business pitch competition where eight businesses will pitch for the chance to win 10K in cash and prizes. And that is coming up um, from January 26th to 28th. Tickets are on sale right now um, for only $99. It's an early bird ticket special that ends on um, the last day to get those is January 20th. So we encourage you to get those for those listening right now um, before the 20th. Um, so I want to talk about our lunchtime topic today. I mentioned a little bit about what, what lunchtime topics are, but like I said, we bring in a business expert, usually someone that lives in Savannah that's been successful with their business to share their wisdom with the startup community um, and help people who are looking to start a business, grow their business, um, whatever. It could be topics on HR, creative topics. And uh, today's topic is focused on more creativity, photography, and videography. And so I'm excited to welcome Tyler Edick. He is um, he works with us here at the Creative Coast. He's our video and photo guy. So, um, you know, we're super excited to have him on today to talk about how he got to where he is. Um, a little bit more about him. He is a video production entrepreneur and independent filmmaker, and he was named Best of the Year Videographer by Savannah Magazine in 2021 and 30 Under 30 by Destinations International in 2020. He holds a bachelor's degree in broadcasting and mass communication and a master's in business administration. And he moved here into Savannah in 2018, luckily, with his dog, Lily. We love Lily, too. Um, and um, we're glad to have him here. So Tyler, thank you so much for coming on today to talk with us and share your wisdom. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, yeah. So let's start with the question I always ask. I, we always want to know a little bit more about your background. I mean, I shared a little bit there, but can you tell us how did you get started in photography and videography? What did that look like? Um, the, I got to give it uh, to my mom because, you know, moms know best. I was, a uh, when I was like 14 or 15, I was really into skateboarding with my buddies and uh, we lived in Rochester, New York, which is the home of Kodak. So my dad had like this really early digital ca Kodak camera and I would just borrow that and then start like shooting video. And I uh, started just filming my friends. And then as I got through high school and everything else, I had just uploaded a bunch of stuff to YouTube. I, I was somehow considering becoming an engineer, which is so crazy because <laughs> I was like in remedial math and everything else. But um, but my mom was like, hey, you like making skateboarding videos. Why don't you go to school for that? And I was like, I can't make money filming skateboarding. And she's like, no, but you could film other stuff and people will, will pay you for that. And so it's been like a long winding path since then. But when I got to school, um, I just like, and I got to play with cameras and in the editing bay and basically just keep improving on what I had already done um, independently. Uh, I, I fell in love and yeah, so that was like 10 years ago. I graduated college 10 years ago this year, so I've been doing it for a while now. And I got to talk about this. You worked for David Letterman for a while. Can we talk a little bit about that? That was through your degree, right? You landed the internship and in, he's in New York, right? Yeah, well, he was. Um, the Late Show uh, with David Letterman, uh, it was in the Ed Sullivan Theater on Broadway on 53rd. And uh, yeah, so it was a semester in college. I just went down there. And of course I was like, Hey, I want to work in like the production department or I want to work with talent. 
and uh, and so what they do is they stick you in the other department, so they where you don't want to be. So I, I I ended up in the on the writing staff, and I'm actually super uh, grateful for that because I was basically the assistant to the assistant of the head writers, and I would run scripts and tapes, and uh, I would bump into celebrities and stuff all the time. But uh, yeah, and I have like uh, you know just a bunch of fun. Mem- I had just turned 21; it was it was a good time. That sounds like the perfect time to be working on a show like that. That's awesome. Um, so I always ask this question too, and this is an important one. It's your why. Why are you passionate about this topic today and sharing it with other people? Uh, I think because people are just get excited about it when I tell them what I do. And I talk to a lot of people that, um, I mean, there's so many hobbyists out there that have cameras and have like a budding interest. And the way my mom just kind of like, pushed me to be like, Hey, you should go take this a little serious. And like, you can make a career out of this. Um, it's, I did not need the, I mean, we could talk about education. I mean, I think I needed to learn the structure and learn how to learn, but you do not need a college degree. Like you do not need formal education to do what I do. And it's never too late to start. And there's a huge demand for photography, videography, live streaming, podcasting, audio editing, like the whole audio visual realm. I mean, even in, just in Savannah, there's like a ton of demand for it. And so it's and there's a million little niches you can get into. And uh, it's it's really widely untapped. So I'm passionate about it because I, I know there's a lot of people out there that want to take it another step further or they, they don't know how, they're scared, they don't know where to start. They think they need all this gear and all this stuff, but you need, you need a, an internet connection. You need a computer that can handle a little bit of editing. And then you need a camera and you don't even need a crazy fancy camera. So anyone can get started today. Okay. So I'm going to kind of jump here because uh, you started Crate Marketing and and that's your business and you worked under that and you worked under that LLC for a while. So, um, you know, when you're starting out, I think a lot of times people are starting out as like a freelancer, um, you know, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily under a business. So I kind of wanted to jump into that. What are the advantages to owning a business versus being that gig worker or freelancer that is not under a company and maybe vice versa? Yeah, I've, and I've done both. Um, so I, I, when you had sent me this question, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll tell everyone my, my, uh, my story and my uh, experience, but I am not like a legal advisor. So you can just take my experience like with a grain of salt and you probably, oh, uh, the Creative Coast is actually going to be launching a series of videos basically helping out with the legal advice of like how you should structure your business. So I've done DBAs, I've done um, sole proprietorships and LLCs, but I mean, there's other things like S corps and C corps and I'm not the pro in that department, but I'll I'll tell you the kind of the progression of crate marketing. Um, My first paying gig was in 2012 and that was just a uh, like, I, they just wrote me a check for a thousand dollars and I produced a 45 minute documentary and uh, it took a year. So I, I don't know what I was making per hour, but I would say it's like pennies. Um, but anyway, uh, from there I started at my first like legal entity was just Tyler Edict Video Services. And uh, that was like some commercial stuff, um, but weddings was like a really early focus of mine. Um, and specifically wedding videos. I've never actually done photography for a wedding. I do do photography, but I I never got into that. Um, But then I realized what happened was I had a wedding, uh, actually had three weddings book on the same day. So I ended up hiring a crew to go out and shoot it for me. And then I realized like, oh, if they screw up, the company name is Tyler Edick Video Services. And I'm not even there to like, to represent my own company. So then I, I had created a brand called T Associates. It was literally just Tyler Edick and Associates, but like kind of, uh, you know, disguised a little bit. And uh, so from there, I, I uh, kind of expanded that. And then I got, <laughs> it's a weird little sidebar. I got into, I tried drop shipping on Shopify. I, I've done a bunch of little uh, miscellaneous entrepreneurial pursuits, but they had a domain available. It was Crate Spot. And uh, just, so we just went with, my buddy and I just went with the name Crate Spot. And then we were going to launch other Shopify stores. And so the, the comp, the umbrella company that was going to advertise those was going to, was became crate marketing just because crate spot was available. And that's how crate marketing came to be. Uh, and then, uh, and then all the Shopify stuff, <laughs> the bottom fell out. And I, I think I, I think I lost money on that for sure. But anyway, crate marketing lived on and that has been like my overarching, 
um, bucket entity since then. And people ask me why, and it's like, that's why, but it's not a great, like, I don't, I'm not like in love with the brand or anything else. It's just an LLC that I filed on the, on the, uh, the, the state website. So. Got it. That's it. That's an important thing to note is deferring people to get the proper legal advice. Cause you really, you know, you have your experiences, like you said, but you don't want to give anybody the wrong information for what they're trying to do. Right. So but that's an interesting story about how you landed on crate marketing for sure. The only advice I can give is that like, don't let the, the weeds prevent you from getting into it. I would say just dive in and then you can figure out the details later on, but yeah, go to a professional. And there's people through the creative coast and stuff that, that know all that stuff. So, yeah. So you're saying as you get more developed, then think about starting that business per chance and getting that legal advice that you need, but you can still be making money of course, without having the business. Um, You just the 1099, you go the 1099 way um, for yourself. Yep. Yep. Um, So um, let's talk about when you're starting out and this can be intimidating for a lot of folks. How did you price things when you started out? And this is, you know, you worked, assuming you've you've slowly worked your way up to these higher prices over time. How did this, how did it look when you started um, get first getting clients? What was your method to pricing? Uh, Yeah. I I mean, at first, basically uh, my advice, the advice I received and the advice I give to other people is just say yes to everything. Um, because at least for me, I learn, I've learned what I like and how to price things just based on what I don't like. And I like, what's not enough money for my, my time and risk. And even you got to factor in, like, you don't think about it at first when you're 18, 19 starting out, but you got the cost of your software, it costs your camera, which depreciates pretty quickly, all your gear, um, you know, gas, mileage, time, editing. Um, so I basically would just see what friends were charging in college or would go, oh yeah, you know, at my at my job where I'm making 725, you know, I'll make, you know, this much per day. And so I wanna make more than that doing photography. So I would end up taking on jobs. I, I think I remember my first wedding, I charged $350 to shoot and edit it. Wow. Um, yeah, which is crazy. Um, They're then, super expensive today, like thousands. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, the quality wasn't, you know, what it would be now, but um, but like they were happy and it was a family friend. I mean, a lot of the early stuff was just friends and friends of friends, you know, friends, older siblings getting married um, or, um, you know, they're like sm- local small businesses, artists, music videos, that kind of stuff. Um but the way I, uh, basically what I would do is I would throw it out there and then I would just make it um, like consistently raise my rates every year or, or more than that sometimes. So yeah, eventually like I charged like a thousand per wedding video and then 2000. And then when I stopped doing those, I was making, I was charging 4,000, but I was also hiring people and like there was, there became a lot of overhead. So, uh, that's what I, I mean. I get why people charge so much, and there's so much editing time on the back end too. Uh, but I stopped because of the. Uh, I stopped with weddings because of just the the stress of the whole thing. But that was just like one of many different niche markets I tried out, um, and it works for some people. But I like to just uh, I don't know be able, be able to rex. But okay, so back to but basically back to pricing. Um, the way I do it now is I'll either do an a la carte uh, thing where I do a, a half day rate or a day rate for my shoot time. Um, and that I try and keep it simple. There's a guy on YouTube uh, called Future, F-U-T-U-R. Um, and he's really helpful with um, creating value-based pricing versus the time that you're spending on something. So I used to think of it as like per hour, but really now I think about it, what value am I bringing to the business? And that's a big part because of this guy future and just experience. So anyway, I'll do a half day rate or a full day rate. Um, and then I'll charge, I'll kind of like do a quote for the editing. And the, the rough rule of thumb is uh, like, if it's a two minute video, two minute finished video, that's going to go on Facebook or TV or OT, um, OTT ads or whatever, it's going to be at least four hours of editing. So like a 30 second video is going to be at least an hour. Um, and then there's other complications in there too. I'm, I'm also like drone licensed and stuff. So like production, I could, I could upcharge for like using the drone or, um, 
doing time lapses or having a second shooter, all that kind of stuff. But then the way, the other way I like to do it currently is uh, retainer based pricing. So, I mean, if you're just starting out and you want to get into photography, yeah, future, F-U-T-U-R, thank you. Uh, like so, so portraits of uh, families and friends, like a super easy way to get in, charge 50 bucks and like just get a, get a little body, a body of body work. So then you can charge more money. Uh, yeah. I mean, do the first couple for free or, or headshots. Like headshots are great for businesses. Like if you work in a business, you can go to your boss and be like, Hey, I, I noticed that like the, the site like needs uh, more cohesive uh, headshots. So you just go set up like natural lighting. If you don't even have lighting gear, I mean, you could do it in portrait mode on your iPhone and then um, just like shoot everyone's photo, you know, or with a camera. And then um, once you have that in your portfolio, then you can, you know, charge per head. So you can go to a big company and be like, hey, yeah, I'll come in and I'll charge 20 bucks per head. And you already you only have to set up your lighting and stuff once. So that's like a really nice way to like get into it. But uh Okay, the last thing is just retaining retainer pricing. I, I charge less per somebody that's going to be paying me consistently, less per hour or per job. And then I don't have to worry about um, basically doing like drawing up quotes and estimates and stuff like that, which I used uh, QuickBooks to do that before. And now I use a tool called FreshBooks, which you can also learn more about in our uh, Creative Coast webinar series that we're working on um, about starting a small business. But anyway, uh, yeah, I like, I prefer retainer stuff, but I'll still do a la carte stuff. And uh, just if it's a new client, I end up usually charging more money up front and then finding a happy medium from there. For someone that might not know, can you break down what retainer pricing is? I think it, the word might be kind of self-explanatory, but just in case, can you kind of explain that? Yeah. So, um, so like a one-off job could be like a company or a nonprofit or whoever client comes to you. They're like, hey, we need you to do this and that. Uh, you know, we need, we need you to come shoot headshots, create a 30 second video for us. Or if maybe if you're just doing photography, they want like some in, interior shots of the building. So you could do like different line items and stuff and you're really custom catering the quote to the job um, versus a retainer, which is like, hey, you give me $500 per month or, you know, $5,000 per month or $20,000 per month, whatever. And I'll come out, you know, two days a month and I'll shoot and it will include all the editing. You'll get at least one or two videos per month. You'll get um, like obviously stuff like headshots you don't need that often unless there's like a new hire. Um, but uh, I mean, you can, so basically a retainer, it creates stability in your business because you've got like consistent income coming in, but you're not necessarily making as much per job. Um, but uh, the stability is good when you're self-employed because it is very much feast or famine. There's like months when I make a ton of money and then other months like around the holiday season, it's slow because, you know, people are with family. And so that's like uh, a way to mitigate the risk, I guess, retainer pricing. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit about all the different experience you have, you know, you've talked about weddings, you talked about headshots, you kind of, you've been in every that I know of, you've done every kind of thing. You've worked in real estate, which you haven't talked about yet. Um, you've worked in weddings, you've done business professional stuff, you've shot events. Um, can you talk, um, about, you know, your experience in all these different realms of photography and videography and sort of maybe like pick a few and break the the advantages and disadvantages of each down. Like you and I have talked about this, for example, you just mentioned weddings and the stress of weddings. You know, I don't think people think about that a lot as like, oh, I can make, you know, $5,000 in a weekend, but there's a lot more that goes into it than that. And it's, it's, it's like a make or break, not, I don't know if that's the right words for it, but like you can botch a wedding and then that's done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you, you, there's no do over. There's no do over yeah. for those. Yeah. Could you kind of break down the realms, maybe starting with like weddings and then real estate? I mean, some are, some industries are more lucrative than others. So, um, you know, if someone's just looking to do this for like, maybe they're trying to get in a magazine, you've also been recognized in magazines as well. So that's something else to think about. Could you, could you talk about that? Yeah, I, I jotted down like a list of different stuff I tried to. Um, so, okay, I just put down one more that I thought of. So, yeah, uh, the first thing was just doing indie indie videos for myself that I would upload in like the early days of YouTube. 
Then my first documentary gig um, was that 45 minute uh, documentary where I interviewed a bunch of people. So that was like a really big first job. Uh, then I, uh, f- I just to get some experience, I started creating like music videos for local bands and stuff. That's definitely something that's really appealing starting out. Uh, working for artists, you know, like everyone wants to shoot musicians and like rest, or at least I always wanted to shoot musicians and restaurants and stuff like that. But um, basically what you kind of come to learn is that you got to go where the money is. And a lot of, you know, that we're called starving artists for a reason. So like, while it is rewarding to do that stuff, you know, collaborate with other artists and work with friends and stuff, you eventually come to learn like, okay, I I probably need to do more like corporate type work, um, which is rewarding in in and of itself. I think like, I think the best part about what I do is that it's always something new. You know, it could be like at a, at a racetrack and then like a, like riding horses and then at a dentist's office or a law firm or whatever, like every week's different. Um, And uh, so for me, that's super rewarding uh, a part of it. So I'm just somebody that has to try new stuff. So then, uh, so then after I worked with like local artists and small businesses, I, I really went in on the, uh, the wedding side of uh, things. Um, I, I had a lot of friends getting married at the time, but also I do like that it is very personal and rewarding. And like, my goal would be like, all right, if I start to sniffle up, then I know I'm, I'm onto something here. Um, and so I, I really did like pour everything into that. Um, but with time i realized that no matter this is just for me like it's a great industry you get to like you get paid to travel they typically will feed you um you know it's pretty laid back compared to some commercial stuff but the the downside is like you've got different bosses you've got the you've got the bride of course the bride and groom of course but you've also got the parents the in-laws the day of planner the or the day of coordinator the planner the other photographer the dj and uh you know and then just the family and and so and then yeah like if a card corrupts or a camera like gets stolen or you know god forbid you have insurance for that kind of stuff but then like (laughs) for me like the emotional risk of it i found out i was like it doesn't matter how much money i charge it's never going to be worth like the stress i put on myself like i would be i would be like sweating the night before like no sleep the night before and then like sweating profusely the day of and i did do stuff to mitigate that like i hired second shooters i had multiple cameras and stuff like that but it was just like for me i was like okay i need to find something else that i can do that it's like i can redo it and not have like not put so much stress on myself so that kind of led to the real estate thing because i was like well if i if i screw up i can go shoot it again uh and real estate was fun um i i and i learned a lot of this stuff just from um like youtube different youtube videos youtube creators um webinars like this one and uh basically i just found out you need like a tripod a flash and uh a camera and a wide angle lens and and then for the video stuff you do need like a a gimbal so that gets a little more complicated but i mean you don't need like a crazy setup to start in real estate or any other niche really um you can just get by with the bare bones and uh so real estate it's cool because um you're working with the realtor and typically the the homeowner's not there. So you just go in and you get to be creative with it. Um, But it is competitive. There are other people out there doing it in Savannah and every like bigger markets, you're gonna have more competition. And and then also it's kind of more of a volume game where it's like, you gotta drive all over the place and you're not making a ton of money per video or per, uh, per project. But if you do enough of them, you can make a good living at it. Um, so I kind of, I still do it for the realtors that I worked with back when I focused on it, but I don't market it or plan to grow that vertical at all. Um, but then, yeah, I, I mean, for photography, I've done like, actually the, the, the background that you're, you're on Kate, that was like, that's a shot I did. Yeah. So, and that's just like with a wide angle lens on a tripod with, um, I don't think I even used a flash. I think it's just all natural light. But uh, but then uh, yeah. So I mean that works. That's fun for small businesses, uh, for commercial or residential real estate. It was fun. Um, really, but there's so many other niches. I wrote down like 
Oh, during COVID, I, I got into more live streaming stuff. So right now I'm talking to you with a laptop, a webcam, and um, a microphone plugged in with an XLR cable. I do have an interface, but that's like, you don't have to think about it too much. But basically all I would do is I would just take this setup, put it on a music stand, and go to an event. I would go to a funeral, a, like a debate forum, uh, other types of live streaming or live events that I could live stream to an audience when during a time when people couldn't have a live audience. So um, that was kind of what helped launch my business um, was just trying new things. And then, um, and then one thing I kind of glazed over a little bit uh, earlier was being a W2 employee videographer. So when I moved to Savannah in 2018, my first job was with Visit Savannah and the Savannah Area Chamber of Commerce, which was awesome. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I moved here and I, I followed the Instagram account. And I was like, who gets paid to take pictures of Savannah? That's super cool. So, and then I ended up working for them and I was like, this is like my dream job. And it was, and uh, I mean, I, and it's still like a, a, a career highlight for sure. Uh, and what I ended up doing is, being a salaried, you know, W-2 employee who was paid to make videos full time. And there are lots of perks to that, like the stability, um, you know, the stability thing I was talking about with retainer clients. Um, you've got a consistent paycheck coming in. You've got health insurance and all this stuff that you're supposed to have <laughs> as, a, as an adult. But, uh, you know, at a, at a 401k and everything else. Uh, but I, uh, but I, I just found out like, uh, just for myself, like I need to constantly be evolving and growing. And so it really was a like part of, um, I, I think if the pandemic didn't happen, I probably, I might still be working there because I, I realized that there were all these people who needed to reach their audience, but had no way of doing so, especially, especially in like the early days of the pandemic. Um, they had no way of reaching their customers. It, you know, it, it, it less and less so, but really I just, I just saw the opportunity and I started uh, freelancing and reaching out to local businesses and in Savannah, it's all who, you know, and the connections you make. So um, yeah, it just like started picking up. And then I was like, Oh, I'm making almost as much money as I make in my job, but like very part-time. And I was like, I, I could probably go out and do this full-time and make like a ton of money. Um, and so uh, yeah. So the, in December of 2020, uh, the first year of COVID, I left my job and I've been independent for more than two years now. And um, like, it's, uh, it's more risk, obviously. Um, you have the, the overhead of, you know, I, I had an office for a while there. So I had utilities to pay for and got to deal with health insurance, which Again, not the expert in that area, but the Creative Coast will be putting together a webinar uh, on that subject for, uh, you know, 1099 and self-employed uh, folk. So stay tuned for that. And um, but I have no regrets and I, uh, I'm super happy that I've been well received by the Savannah community. And uh, yeah, I did get that, that award like my first year of being independent. I was like, wow, that was kind of my goal is to be like the number one video guy. And then I, and then like Savannah magazine named me the video guy. And I was like, all right, now what do I do? So I'm still trying to figure it out. And so right now I'm actually focused on, I try and do as much work with nonprofits as possible. And then um, stuff that's like personally meaningful and then more like long form content. So like nonprofit working with the creative coast uh, and then just other nonprofits in town. I try and do as much of that as possible. So. I think what I love about video and photography so much is it's something that you can either like if, if it's something you're passionate about and you want to earn some money from it, but you don't want to quit your full time job, you can pick it up on the weekend. There's so many areas and industries that you can work in. And, I, to, to you know, to your point of saying like all the different things that you've tried, it's like there's room to grow or to not grow. And um, and it's also it can be very, very lucrative. So you look at some of the, you know, like what you've done and, and how you built it over the years and how you started and ramped up on your pricing. And now you, you're, you know, you're on retainer at places and things like that. I mean, there's, there's room to be creative with it as well. Like 
you know, like creative with how you structure things. And so I, I like that a lot. And, um, you know, I also think too, if you want to do just photography, if you explore everything, you can do that. If you find that there's more need for videography, then delve into that. Um, then there's also the video editing aspect of it. There's the sound design aspect of it. And so I kind of, I also, um, I won't talk about the equipment you use, but I, I kind of want to jump to another question I had is, is like, you, since you kind of do it all, like there's literally degrees in sound design. There's, you know, you know, editing is its own thing. Um, video is its own thing, photography, but you do it all. And how I'm assuming that's been really advantageous for you. I mean, there's some people who may just want to focus on one area of those things, but can you talk a little bit about how that's worked for you over time? Like, you know, I think you started with video and then you probably picked up on photography from that. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I worked backwards to photography, um, but I primarily consider myself like a filmmaker or, or videographer, but um uh, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. I think like I, I, the advice I got was say yes to everything. And then now the advice I give is like, get to the point where you can say no to almost everything. Um, not because, not because I, I, I want to help everybody. I want to take on every single, um, project that comes across like new and exciting stuff. That's what I look for nowadays, but there's just so much, there's only so much time. And that's where it comes. You can either uh, charge more money or scale your business, which means like hiring editors and hiring uh, second shooters or a whole team of people to go out and shoot for you. Um, which like for the um, for like a lot of the live stream stuff in town, Stagefront is like a, they're an awesome resource, um, but they handle more of like the large size projects that you'll see like you know at the the bigger venues in town. Uh, whereas, whereas like what I was doing is more of like the, you just show up with your laptop and connect to the Wi-Fi and stream it to Facebook. Uh, so there's like a, there's a, there's a need there, but really, yeah, you just try everything. Um, and then you think like, oh that was fun. Uh, I want to do more of that or, oh that paid well. I want to do more of, of that kind of thing just because, you know, depending on what your needs are. Um, so yeah, I think you just have to follow the the need in the market. I mean, that's what they say with, you know, every product or it really, that's what entrepreneurship is, is, uh, uh, I just heard this quote the other day. It's like a, it's like a commitment to, uh, to, to not giving up and just trying new things. Basically I butchered the quote. I don't remember what the exact quote is, but basically it's like a tenacious, non relenting drive to just try new things and see what works. And so, yeah, I think of it was like little seeds that I've planted and like some stuff, if I, like, I know that I could have grown any of these, you know, niche markets into something really big, but um, yeah, just for me. And I think like for most creative people, there needs to be like that sense of fulfillment. So that's where like now, like working with nonprofits and doing stuff that's more personally like meaningful to me and then also new and exciting stuff that's kind of where I place my emphasis more so than just like doing what I need to do to make a buck but that comes with like growing confidence too it's like okay I don't know I don't have any gigs lined up this for the next three weeks so I don't know where my paycheck's coming from but I know somebody's gonna call me and like inevitably anytime that happens like it's like hey uh, what are you doing next Thursday or whatever so, so like after two years of, of doing it full time, I, I, I know that like, okay, it's going to work out. You're going to, you're going to p- be able to cover all your bills and stuff. And uh, so I can be more discerning with what jobs I take on. And then also give myself enough time to focus on the next little ventures of like, okay, where am I going to go with this? Like, I do love the travel industry and I want to do more, I mean, it would be great to get paid to travel. So, you know, that's something I'm working towards in 2023. Um, But then, yeah, still working with, you know, I I just like, I like the good karma points of doing meaningful work and working with nonprofits, but that's just me. I mean, if if you want to go out there and like, I I, like, even if I had a million dollars tomorrow, I wouldn't be the guy to go get like a Mercedes or whatever. So like, that's not my driver. That's not like money's money's important, but it's not like what's, motivating me to it's more like the creative fulfillment for me so but i mean the the money's there and the demand is there like there's so many people you could go in on any of these little niche verticals 
in photography or videography and make a killing at it, uh, even right here in Savannah, um, there is a demand for it. Um, event photography, event videography, you know, Bunny, we, everyone knows Bunny yeah. Ware. She's at like everything. So she's, yeah. I mean, that's her niche, right? Um, but uh, yeah, you just try stuff and see what you like, what pays well and just do more of that and do less of the other stuff. Right. That, that's been the big takeaway from your career that I've noticed is like, you don't really uh, peg yourself or or nail yourself down to one thing. And I, I feel like that's been huge for you. And it, it's helped us as with us being your customer, because we have all these different needs arise when it comes to social media and events. So from a programming and communications perspective, because like, that's what we do here at the Creative Coast, we have, we've had Tyler run live streams for us and he, he's, you know, like you said, he pulls up a camera and live streams it to Facebook. And that's been huge for us, especially during the pandemic. That was big. You know, um, we've had him be the sole photographer at our events. We've had him be the videographer. Our friends. He shot communications videos for us where he's filmed our executive director or me t- uh, speaking about our programs that we can then promote on our, our website and on, on pay on our, um, uh, on social media. So I think there's, adva- I personally think there's an advantage to it. And that's why I wanted to kind of address that. Cause I think sometimes we're just going to get into it. People think they're just going to get into an industry and it's going to be a success, but you do kind of have to experiment with what's working and what works for you. And so, um, can you talk to then, um, I have this further down in the questions, but I want to go and get there because I think that's a concern, that feast or famine type of thing. What's been the most advantageous resource when it comes to increasing your customer base or just ensuring you having customers? Because some people might think they have to do crazy amounts of marketing or have the perfect videos on their own social media pages. What works? Yeah. <laughs> What's worked for you? Yeah. Uh, so I like was really heavily focused on websites and social media and stuff when I first launched my business. And then after like a year and a half, I was like, I don't think I've ever gotten a job from Instagram. So I like, I cut all that stuff just because it was like, I, that's probably not good advice. (laughs) And I know like there's other people in town that would be like, are you crazy? But for me, it's been all like people I know and connections of connections. And, uh, you know, it's, it's Savannah. Like it's, you you just gotta, um, you got a network you come to the creative coast uh, uh social events i'm also a member of the savannah jc's the junior chamber international uh it's a youth leadership organization here's my little plug uh, uh dan now but uh it's a youth leadership organization for young professionals 21 to 40 and uh it's not like bni or which bni is great but uh it's not like these professional networking groups where you're there to get business. It's a a youth leadership org where you're doing nonprofit work and you're, and you're, um, you know, giving back to the community. And and so the focus is not networking, but there are people in every uh, industry and all these big companies in town, a lot of nonprofit people, a lot of like-minded people who want to give back. And so for me, like a lot of my friends, most of my clients, everything has come from either like the JC's or working with the Savannah area chamber of commerce or the creative coast. Um, and just people, if you're there with a camera, every event I go to, someone's like, Oh, Hey, what do you, you do you have a website or, or like do you have a card on you? And I never do. And I should, uh, (laughs) go to Vista print, just print a thousand of them for $5 or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, it's just who, you know, and then, um, and then, um, yeah, I get a zillion calls a day, but I always answer the nine one twos. And then, um, now that all that being said, like I said, I am trying to break into more of the, uh, paid travel work. So I do have the stuff I did with visit Savannah as a portfolio piece, having a portfolio, like not necessarily not like, you know, it's different than it used to be. You used to have like a physical book that you would send to people, but like, it could be an Instagram for me. It's more like a website. I try and keep my costs down and also my time costs down. So like maintaining social media was just kind of like a drag for me. So uh, for me, it's just like a website. And then I am doing more direct sales type stuff where I, I'll just like create a spreadsheet with like different companies and the names of the people I need to reach out to the contacts, what their role is, and then um, creating like uh, an opener email, follow-up email, pitch deck, the whole thing. So I do do the 
direct sales stuff if I want to try something new. Like when I wanted to get into real estate, it's like, all right, where do I start? So I found a friend that was a realtor, shot his, did a video in photography for free just to learn how to like how to shoot it even or how to edit them. And then that was, <laughs> by then I had already like tried several other uh, niches. So it's like, okay, here's my portfolio. I shot one house. Now I'm a real estate professional. Uh, so for me, like, yeah, it's mostly who, you know, getting involved, uh, especially locally. I mean, there's a, there's a ton of demand for this stuff. And then if you want to try something new, like you might have to go more sales, the more sales and marketing route, which could be social media. For me, it's just my website, tyleredic.com. I, I've had tyleredic.com since I'm like 17 years old. And this is like the 10th or 15th version of this website. Like, and also my, my brand name, like create marketing. Like I'm not tied to that. It's just like, it's just the, I, I think of it as a startup kind of thing. Like, again, I'm planting all these seeds and then like one of these things is going to grow into a big, beautiful Southern Magnolia tree or something. But, uh, yeah. Did I answer the question? <laughs> no, you did. You did. And I, I wanted to get back to the social media because I, I run social media for a living, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I, and so it, where I think the differentiator is, of course, like, if you're like a dentist, you're doing all your work in the office and nobody's seeing it. So you need to get your work out there on different platforms so people can see the befores and afters, right? Like if Who's you're doing audience? cosmetic dentistry or something with what you're doing is your work speaks for itself. Like, and so having your website, I can go to your website and see like, oh, these, this is his portfolio. Not saying that you're not, you know, I've seen your videos on, um, on Facebook too, where you're, you've, you had the podcast, the creative truth. And so, um, you know, I do see, I've seen that stuff. Of course I know you, so that's different, but in Savannah, so much stuff is word of mouth. And so I really wanted to ask that question because I figure that's where you're going. It's where it's meeting people and having them connect you like, Hey, he did this job for me. You should get him too. as a freelancer in social media, being the best at social media is not what got me the, the jobs that it did. It was, uh, it was people going, she did a really good job for me on social media. Like she got our business more awareness, The value. So yep. your, your work in, in that field kind of speaks for itself and the people speak for it. And I think, I mean, to your point about not using social media, I think that's the difference, right? Like when you're trying to like get the, like no one can see what you're doing because it's all behind the scenes, you know, it's different, but you're so out there, your work has to be out there because you're giving it to clients to put out there. So, um, and, and that that's been huge for me from a social media standpoint. And I also think too, like when I do my, when my clients are getting accolades for what they're people, what people are seeing on social media, then I know I'm doing the job I need to. And eventually it's going to come back. Right. So as long as I'm doing a good job. <laughs> oh, and, and I know so many people who have been like highly successful with social media, even doing like what I do. And I, and I follow a lot of those other creator, creator creatives or creators as well. Um, but like, yeah, I guess like, because I'm more B2B, LinkedIn and my and YouTube and my website's like enough and then just word of mouth. But yeah, if you're B2C, if like if you're selling a product or uh, if you're B2C, you should probably have social media. I don't want to, I don't want to fully discount social media. Social media. Is no, no, I, I didn't take it that way. But <laughs> I just I wanted to make sure that people understood that I where you know that that it's valuable, but when, with what we're doing, a lot of times our work speaks for, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily have to put it in on our own channels. Like I, my so personal social media stinks. Like <laughs> I don't have a ton of followers and I've had people say, well, like I've, I've seen people go, well, that person has like 15,000 followers on their social media. So they must be really good at it. I'm like, it's different when you're working for a client, when you're working for yourself, yeah. it's completely different. Mm -hmm. completely different. When you're trying to speak to someone else's brand, that's a skill in and of itself. So it all depends on where you're trying to go with this. Like another thing to think about is you have to get into the mindset of the business you're working for or the individual you're working for and what they want. And so if you're turning this in from, if you're taking this from a hobby to a business and I'm just chiming in here, sorry, I don't mean to, I'm just get fired up about this because I don't think people fully understand too. If you're turning something from a hobby into your business, completely different feel. Like you really do have to cater to your client. It's very rare that you have clients go, just do what, do what you're doing. 
Like yeah. a lot of times they have creative input they want to have. Um, and so that changes things, right? But sometimes if you're really good at what you do too, they just want you to do it all. And if you're good, meaning you understand their brand, you're working towards their brand and you're not just doing your own thing. I've had people come in and try to do their own thing on social media. I'm like, no, no, no. There's a brand voice. There's a brand, there's brand colors. We need to try to stick with that. So that's just something to think about. I don't know. I, I'm just, you got me thinking there. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's your confidence in yourself at, in what you do. Uh, whether it is social media or design or photography or videography or audio or whatever. But then, yeah, it's the trust with the client. Uh, and then, yeah, I can also like suss out somebody that r reaches out to me and I'm like, you're going to be trouble. Like <laughs> you're, you're going to be hard to work for just yeah. because, yeah. I, and so I, I just kind of have a sense of that now of like, all right, yeah. Like sometimes my ego needs the, oh my God, this looks so good, Tyler. Like, thank you so much. But then like the email where I'm like, it's like, looks good, period. I'm like, ah, I, you know, like my ego wants more than that. But at the end of the day, it's like they said, like they're happy and they're not uh, creating more, like they're easy. They're easy to work with. So, uh, so I kind of like when I have more creative control and creative freedom and stuff. But yeah, I mean, you don't, I'm not like married to any of my projects. I've created, like I've shot and edited and created full videos just for my client or my boss or whoever to be like, yeah, we're not, it's just not right. Like it's not what we thought it was, or it's not the right, you know, the time has passed or whatever, just like stuff gets axed and it's like, okay, well, moving on. Like I might keep that for my portfolio, but I'm like not married to it. But, so yeah, it's like, I don't know. It's just the confidence you have in yourself. And then, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I mean, you, you just build client trust, and that's another part of the retainer thing. Is like, it's a it's a relationship. It's a two way street. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. You 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 hit the nail on the head. You're providing value. You're trying to create value. Like, why would you pay me five hundred dollars a month or fifty thousand dollars a month? You know, I'm making up numbers, but why would you pay me or why should I pay you this money on a recurring basis? Well, it's like, well, I'm going to solve these problems for you. So I'm, I'm speaking as the person, like the person that wants to get into photography or videography. But if I were to flip it the other way and think about like a retainer for, um, from the business perspective, it's like, they don't have to go out and find a new live stream guy or audio guy or photography guy or video guy or whatever. Every, every time they have a new event, you know, they just go, okay, Tyler, put this on your calendar, or they literally just put it on my calendar. I'm like, yeah, I'll be there. You know, so it removes some of that, like, there's, there's stability on both sides because it is a relationship. And um, so, yeah, I mean, so that's really what you're trying to do is just like make connections and build a relationship and then create value for them, which is why you can justify charging money. And it's like, well, I need to make this much because then I don't have to go out and look for 10 other jobs, you know? And I mean, and that's where, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that can be relevant to somebody that's working a W2 full-time salary job. It's like, that's what you're doing is you're creating value for your organization. So. Right. Well, I want to get to these last few questions. I realize it's 1250. Um, told you, I told you I could talk. I know. Well, I think I'm at, I'm going off our original plan of what we were going to talk about a little bit. Um, but okay. So I want to talk about equipment because this is a common misconception that you got to have the best equipment or all the pieces, what all the lenses, you know, I think that was a question I had for you when I was thinking about getting a camera, I was like, Hey, like what kind of lens is that? And do I need to get like blah, 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 blah. And you had a pretty straightforward answer for me, but can you talk about what kind of equipment you, you already mentioned it like baseline equipment is all you need to get started. But can you talk about one, what you need to get going for videography for um, including editing? Like what kind of, uh, that was a separate question. Like what kind of software editing software do you use? Um, and then um, you know, like lenses you use for your camera for photography versus videography. I mean, you talked about drones. I, I'm asking a lot. This is a loaded question. So maybe let's just break it down to by section. Let's start with maybe photography what do you need to get going? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you need a camera, you need a computer that has something to edit, uh, the photos and you need an internet connection. 
and it can be your phone. And, and it could, your phone could be all three of those things, actually. Um, now, you're not going to look like the most professional vendor if you walk in with an iPhone. Um, actually, but Bunny shoots mostly iPhone stuff nowadays because she, she, has, she has a name. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so and that anyway. works. That works, especially with social media, because I can't tell you. And like originally when we started out, we were reformatting all the videos to go on stories when stories became the big thing, remember? Or like reels are big now. So um, like Facebook, if you're creating ads or something, just thinking yes. about for clients, yeah. thinking about for clients, like it won't post my ads in those um in like a regular, like 16 by, what is it? 16 by nine or something format. Yep. So I have to, we have to go back in and reformat them. So thinking about that too, is like shooting from the phone can be advantageous. Go ahead. Sorry. No. And they, and they're, and like, they're made to shoot people like they're um, they have in, interior processing. So like, as you shoot the photo, it's doing HDR, it's making people look good. And she's got like a little light rig and stuff and everything else. Um, but yeah, I mean, she literally is going to these events and charging money and, uh, shooting on her iPhone. So like, you can, you can do it, like I said, today. Um, but then when it comes to like, when you want to level up and become like more of, um, you know, professional gear, I guess, uh, the standard for a long time was a DSLR digital single lens reflex, you know, like Canon Nikon, um, and then uh, nowadays, it's, uh, stuff's moving more mirrorless cameras. Uh, so they're like a DSLR. I've got mine here. I'm not going to get up and get it. But uh, they're just more like a compact body. And as far as like what you spend, uh, there's a minimum price. And then there's, there's no ceiling. So you could probably start for like less than, like you could probably get a camera, a used Canon 70D, Canon 80D with like touchscreen autofocus stuff. My first camera was like a Canon like 40D, 60D, 70D. I think I went, I never got the 90D, but I had like two 70Ds. Then I went full frame, which I know I'm speaking jargon, but um, if you're a photographer, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. I went full frame with a really, Visit Savannah, I was shooting on a super old uh, Canon 5D Mark III, um, which is full frame sensor but it was like eight or nine years old. So it didn't shoot, didn't shoot 4k, didn't shoot slow-mo. Um, but it, I mean, you know, still had uh, a ton of uh, time left on the shutter count. So I could, I did a lot of, I mean, I could still do a lot of photography. You can still do a lot of photography with an old camera. You can go on eBay, get a used camera for 500 bucks camera and the kit lens um, spend money on like a decent tripod and and then, yeah, um, if you're doing for free stuff, Canva, Canva's amazing. Like if you're trying to get in on the cheap, um, I'm sure there's other free photo you can editing edit in Canva now. That's like a, a edit video. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can do video now. Yeah. You can edit wow. video. And I mean, like your computer typically comes with some kind of editing software. I know yeah. like I had my parents HP when I like my computer, my Mac broke and I use my computer maker. HP to edit, yeah. to edit video for the longest time. It wasn't fancy software, but it worked. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, and there's so many, there's so many people like doing it right in reels and TikTok now. That's like, I like, they're my, they're not really my, they're, I don't really believe in competition because there are all these niches, but there are like so many creators nowadays um, that, yeah, like the apps have made it way easier, but yeah, I learned like Windows Movie Maker was the first thing. And then I learned actually Adobe Premiere. And then in college, the standard was uh, iMovie. So I learned iMovie and then I went back to, and I messed around in uh, like DaVinci Resolve and uh, Vegas something, I, don't, I can't remember. But these are all I, video editing, right? Those are all video editing, but I pay for the Adobe Suite and- You can do photo and video in that, right? It, yeah, and audio. So it comes with, I use Adobe like, on my screen, I got Adobe Premiere, Adobe After Effects, Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Lightroom, Adobe Illustrator, which I don't really use that much anymore, InDesign. Some basic graphic design stuff will be helpful if you're doing like graphic heavy stuff or like, yeah, that's another niche. Like you talk about the editing, uh, I'm going to be the guy chopping this up after this uh, is over, right? Yeah. And uh, so, and uploading it to, if, if y'all don't know, this will be posted on YouTube, which I know you have a spiel at the end, but they also go on our um, 
our podcast platforms. So you can listen to me ramble on for an hour on uh, Google play and iTunes <laughs> and Spotify and all that. But anyway, uh, yeah, I, I pay for the Adobe suite and it does, it does everything. It's like 50 bucks a month, but I pay for the whole year up front. I also pay for a tool called motion array, which keeps going up in price. Cause I keep telling people not just me, but um, it's basically all free stock assets. So stock photo, stock audio, most, I mostly use it for stock audio. Uh, or like a, it's basically like Adobe stock, but you pay for the you pay monthly or annually, and you get unlimited downloads. So it's like super super valuable. But yeah, now now I'm shooting on a, a Sony A7 III. I've had it for um, five years now, maybe even six years, and I have one worker one workhorse lens. It's a 24 to 240. If you're a camera photography person, you know. It's it's a workhorse because I rarely have to swap it out. It shoots it shoots fairly wide and it shoots pretty telephoto, or really telephoto. Um, so it does mostly everything I need. Um, there's a thing, a documented uh, phenomenon called gear envy, which is like I need this gear. If I just had this gimbal or drone or a lens, like I could charge more money. And so, um, like. <laughs> Until you're like super high tier, I I don't think that you're actually creating much more value, especially because most people are watching your Facebook ad or OTT uh, over the top uh, pre-roll ad on like a phone or they're not watching it on a 4K, 8K monitor. You're not shooting a movie most of the time. You can get by with not a lot of money and just starting out, um, especially if you're a hobbyist and you already have some of this stuff. A, a decent tripod. I, I'm somebody that's rough on my gear. So I like rugged. I, I'll spend extra money on the tripod because I throw it in the, my the trunk of my car and then I have it on the beach on Tybee and I'm sticking it in the sand and the salt water is getting into the joints and stuff like that. And I, I drop it out my car every once in yeah. a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <gonna> drop it. <laughs> so yeah, it's like good to spend, uh, good to spend like a, when you get to the point where like, what I like to do is like, I buy everything cash. So like, I don't buy the new gear until I have enough money to pay for it. Um, so like, I'm going to earn, like, if I know I want to upgrade my camera, which this year I'm probably going to upgrade my computer. And then next year will be my camera. I know I need to make, make enough money in profit um, with the camera I have now to pay for the next camera. So, but I would say with my $2,000, $3,000 camera with the, the uh, lens and the tripod and everything, I made over six figures from that, from that little camera over the course of well over six figures. Like I've, over the course of five, six years, I've made way more than that. So, uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it costs more than a car, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's going to have a big return on investment for you. But yeah, I would gear envy. Like you gotta just tell yourself, like, am I actually going to make more money with this? And how often am I going to use this lens? Like having different lenses is great and you can get creative with it, but like, it's not, necessarily going to create more value for your customer. So, uh, and Some then of it too is lighting, right? Like that's often what I hear from you and I've heard from others, like the lighting makes a huge difference on how professional something looks, right? You're, you've got a window to your left, right? Or is that your right? To my left, you're right. Yeah. You're <laughs> to my left. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm facing a window. So I'm intentionally like, I mean, it's probably actually not the most flattering look for me. I'd like it if I had a little more shadow under here, but, but yeah, lighting is important. I mean, what I do when I'm shooting headshots, Savannah's kind of tough because of all the live oaks in the Spanish moss where there's all these like holes of light coming through the shadow. Um, so I'll just literally point my camera at somebody and then like spin around until I see light that I like, like ambient light coming off of, and you can get all, you can go all crazy with like you learn how to shape light with bounce cards. And, and, and again, with the gear envy, you could have 14 different flashes and they're all on tripods all around. They're all synced. So that like, uh, but that's where like, those are like, if you're, if you're a photographer on that level, you're charging, that's why you're charging a ton of money is because you're taking the time for this one, you know, magazine cover to, sh to shape light, to be like the ultimate, most flattering thing. And if, if that's what you want to get into, you just have to learn how to shape light. But uh, as, as somebody that's like, that's not my thing. I, I'm more of like a storyteller, like not a, I'm more of a video guy and like verbal story, storyteller than a visual storyteller. So like, I'm not the greatest at shaping light, but what I just do is I have people face a window <laughs> pretty much, or I just 
go with my eye and like, okay, yeah, that looks good. Snap. That's your new headshot. Um, so yeah, I don't, you know, I don't overthink it too much. I just like, I mean, and you kind of learn like how to, it's just like practice and trial and error, going to YouTube, learn this stuff. And then, uh, but yeah, there's like little tips, which this is my second lunchtime topic. If you want more of like the practical little tips like that to improve your video quality at home, you can go watch that one on YouTube. So yeah, we can, um, we'll link it underneath your, this one. So people know that there's a, a preceding uh, video, not, this isn't part two, it's a separate topic, but. Yeah. I wanted to talk to more like hobbyists and people that want to get into the field this time around. Can we, one question about the, and you've kind of already answered this, but I want to make sure I, I'm just want to understand myself and I'm sure other people do too. So like, so you have a drone, right. And you talked mm-hmm. about in real estate, how you know, that's a more needed thing. Like, cause people want to get those aerial views looking over the marshes and the home and how we're like, like it's a, if it's a house in the water, they're showcasing that, or if it's near the water, do you find that certain equipment has made your business more valuable? Um, like, you know, you talked about like having all the different flashes up for photography. Like, I mean, does that allow you down the road to charge more? I mean, you're setting your own price, but when you have that, has that, have you been able to say like, I'm going to get drone footage with this. So we're going to charge X amount. Um, and that a la carte kind of style that you talked about as opposed to the retainer style. Um, well, I, I don't think you need, it's not what I, gear is important, right? And having all the different lenses is, it opens up your toolbox but I don't think it's the end all be all of like what makes you good at your craft. Because if you were to like tell uh, Steven Spielberg to shoot a movie on an iPhone, like he's going to create an amazing movie, right? Like he's yeah, the value comes from the that's person. Super yeah. old, super old reference. But anyway, like yeah, it's 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 more of like try stuff and then. Like for me, it's about being excited and doing new things. So I, when I was like, oh, I can make money flying drones. Uh, so I did go out and get licensed. You need to, you do need to be licensed by the FAA if you're going to accept money, uh, if, you're gonna, if there's going to be any money exchange in the transaction, even indirectly, uh, you need a license. Um, and, but you can learn all that stuff on YouTube, which is what I did. I, I just spent like, I don't know, a couple of weeks watching YouTube videos about getting my drone license. And then I went and took the test and yeah, I've been licensed since 2018, I think. And I have to renew that every two years. Um, and I, I mean, I know for a fact that the drone has more than paid for itself. So I didn't get the high end because I didn't know if it could make me money. I just got like the pro, what I would call prosumer level drone, a Mavic Air 2 versus mm-hmm. like the Mavic, uh, the Mavic Pro or the uh, DJI Inspire, which is some of the higher tier um, products. But I, um, but I uh, basically got it on the hope that it would make me money. And then uh, I know that I've made, uh, it was like, I don't know, 1200 bucks with uh, battery, extra batteries and rotors and everything else. And so I know it's at least paid for itself uh, doing real estate and whatnot. Um, but I'm not also the, like probably the best accountant. So I don't have it like direct attributions of like this percentage of this job will go to my capital expenditure of the drone. Right. Um, I should probably get a, I should probably work with an account, but, but anyway, um, yeah, I mean, basically where I'm at right now is I want to do more long form documentary stuff. That's personal to me. I'm working on a independent documentary about my family currently uh, and I have plans to do more documentaries after this one's finished. So I do plan to upgrade first my computer because it's, uh, as file sizes get larger with photography and videography, you, you need more, um, CPU. It's not your GPU, it's your CPU. And I'm not a computer guy either, but I just from computer friends to do video editing, um, than photography. So you don't even need something crazy. You could probably spend like, I don't know, five or 600 bucks. Like probably the computer you're on now will work for photo editing in Lightroom, but for video editing, just to save myself time as I'm shooting with more 4K footage, um, ProRes, like raw, basically raw if you're a photography person, footage, there's, there needs to be more processing power. So I'm going to keep my computer 
And instead of like upgrading individual components and have that be like my photography computer and audio, and then I'm going to get like a new uh, supercomputer for video editing. And that's like, it's just big being intentional of like, okay, I can spend way less time uh, rendering and exporting and uploading if I have something that has more processing power. Um, and, and then the camera is just like, it's not, it's not like I'm going to charge more money because I get a new camera. It's just that technology is advancing so fast that it's like what I paid for this can't like the lenses don't really depreciate, but the camera body itself, we're going to see more and more of these like smart features that you'd see in a phone incorporated into a camera where it's like doing some processing real time to save in the editing time. Um, and uh, as well as like, I know some people uh, do like real time Wi-Fi or Bluetooth stuff where it's like actually sending the photos to a monitor at the event or to your computer. So, um, so just like more smart features like that. So basically I don't need, I don't need a new camera uh, right now, but I'm intentionally knowing like, okay, like maybe next year I, I'm going to need to save up this chunk of change um, because I want to start using some of these new features and not charge more money because of that. But like, alongside it, I guess, if that, right. is that, does that help? That makes sense. I mean, I think back to, you know, I was talking about using the HP to edit videos and the amount of time it took because it was also an older computer that I, I mean, I, I found that like, I wanted to get like the gaming computers that have the fast processors and what are they like 16, yeah, 16 gigabytes or something like or whatever. something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like that was always what I was looking at because I knew that I'm going to have a bunch of tabs open on top of that because I work in social media. I'm going to be editing videos. I'm going to be cutting clips. I'm going to be changed, like adding graphics. So I need something that can process quickly. Um, okay. We came up to 107 here. We're, we're after our time. So I wanted to finish with the last two questions. Um, one, any last bits of advice we didn't cover you'd like to impart to listeners? And then where can people go to find more information about you online? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say just like, don't let the fear prevent you from trying. Um, just get out there and do it and figure it out. And then, um, and then, yeah, talk to people, ask if people are happy to help. It is it is hard to collaborate with other create. Like in my experience, it's been a little difficult to collaborate with other creatives. Um, and I, I mean, yeah. I, some people view it as competition. I, again, I don't really view it that way. There's enough room at the table for everybody. And then some, I mean, if everyone watching this goes out and becomes a videographer tomorrow, they're not going to put me out of work. Like there's enough right. out there to feed everyone. Um, so yeah, just go for it. Um, it, you know, if you're into like, I didn't even mention like landscapes and like there's architectural stuff different than real estate. And then there's like landscape stuff and selling stock photos and prints and which I've tried a little bit of that too. Um, you know, there's so many places you can go with it. Just get out there and try it and then see what other people are doing and just do that. Like if you want to, if, if you want to get into this niche, go find other companies that are doing it like in a different market. Like my whole real estate business was modeled after, I'll give them a shout out, Vast Media out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Like I basically just saw what they did and did that. And then it was, it like became moderately successful. Like I, I just copied what they did, but they also, you know, that's, there's a book called Steal Like an Artist. So you don't have to be new and creative and original with every business idea. Just go see what works and go try it. And the sooner you start, the better. And and then, uh, yeah, and then the last thing is how to connect with me. I got rid of all the socials, but LinkedIn. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn at Tyler Edick. And then my website, tyleredick.com, has basically like the latest of what I'm working on. So right now it's very like travel and maybe podcast focused. 